Hello and welcome to episode eight of the A Plus show. If you don't know what that is, it's Apple and Alec or Alec and Apple. My name is Michael Apple. I'm Alec Hogg. And this is a 30 minute conversation. We are promising you around various topics of business, news, markets, politics, investments. Let's get straight into it. Alec, what can people expect from your side today? Yeah, and providing context as well yes. on what happened. Perspective and context, that's really what we're about. Uh, I'll be talking to the markets. It's been a very interesting week in the markets. However, not as bad as it has been recently. Um, we, we pretty much flatlined, uh, which you can hardly believe given the volatility. I'll also be talking about the Res uh, South African Reserve Bank governor suggesting that he's played his cards well, so interest rates are going to increase in South Africa, but they're not going to hurt the economy. Um, okay. <laughs> and then we'll talk about my trip to the Eastern Cape, Mike. I spent a couple of days uh, going around parts of the Eastern Cape, St. Francis, uh, Abeja, uh, and uh, also to um, the, the place where the whole Eastern Cape uh, – Game reserve tourism started, Shamwari, and in particular a place called the Founders Lodge, hosted by one of South Africa's great entrepreneurs, Adrian Gardner, who turns 80 in March next year. So to get the opportunity to spend quality time with someone who's really been there, done that, gone bust, built up again, uh, was just a privilege of note. So hopefully I'll share a few of uh, his stories and, and the stuff that I saw. My side, Alec, and you're so right. It's about providing context to the information that is out there. And the big news story in politics was uh, part five and six of Zondo's final report uh, from the state capture inquiry that got delivered to the president last night. And then, of course, the president himself under siege, charges laid against him by the former spy boss, Arthur Fraser, it's being called Pala Pala Gate. Um, let's we'll, we'll, long. <laughs> we will dig. Yeah, it doesn't not couch gate. Doesn't sofa gate. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't roll off the tag. We'll we'll get stuck into pala that. Pala 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 Pala. That which means I looked it up. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a wind instrument from the horns of a sable antelope. Now, those are magnificent antelopes. So those huge horns, and you can imagine that if yes. you cut that off, it would make a pretty good trumpet. <laughs> All right, and let's take us into the messy world of the markets. Well, the markets have been extraordinary, Mike, over the last few months. Uh, they have been declining. They've moved into what we call a bear market. Uh, a bull market is where all the news that comes out is interpreted positively. A bear market, any news that comes out is interpreted negatively. Mm -hmm. And so we're now in a bear market. How long it's going to last is anybody's guess. We're in a speeded up world. The Markets have fallen sharply in a very short period of time. But in the last week, we had a lot of volatility. For instance, on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, we, uh, the All Share Index is trading around 1,000 points lower, which is not really that bad when you're talking on a base of over 60,000. But there's been a swing from 65,000 to 68,000. So a swing of about 4.5%, which is big in, in stock market terms. The RAND also been bumping around. Uh, it, it got into the um, just above 15 Rand 50 to the US dollar mm. and then above 16 Rand to the US dollar where it's trading at the moment. And against the pound 19 Rand 50 ish, it's now 19 Rand 62. So although there has been volatility, it's pretty much flatlining of the markets to where we were a week ago. On the crypto side, it also gives you an indication that the Cryptocurrencies have been under huge pressure in the last month. Mm. The Jaltec basket is down 32%. So it's lost a third of its value, but we've seen the underlying assets in there, for instance, Bitcoin, going down to as low as $17,000. That was $60,000 not that long ago. Yeah. And it's now back above $20,000, which according to Vinnie Lingham, who I'll have you know is a South African, who's a big name in Silicon Valley, like Elon Musk and some others, he has said that if Bitcoin can hold the $20,000 level, then it could bounce off this. If it falls below $20,000, watch out. So there's, there's many uh, views on where the markets are going. 
What you can almost underwrite is we're in a bear market, so it's likely that asset prices will decline. For how long, though? That's anybody's guess. For how far? That, too, is only for the realm of the speculators and the traders. As an investor, we always suggest that take a five-year view and you will then not end up selling just before things bottom out or indeed buying just before uh, things start falling. So investment is long-term. Uh, it's a long-term game and never better, more, better advice than doing so right now. Uh, and international, what's going on at the Fed, Alec? And is that going to impact on us here? Mike, it's uh, today Jay Powell, who's the, uh, he's there, let's uh, say, uh, he's the head of the Federal Reserve, well known around the world. He's having his second day of testimony to the House Financial Services Committee. The, the Yanks are really good at this. They bring together their public servants in public testimonies where the representatives of the people, the um, congressmen and uh, senators, get to ask them questions, and sometimes very hostile questions. Mm. Uh, he, he had a, a, a session yesterday, today, Thursday, is his second session. The markets are up a little bit ahead of his appearance uh, on Capitol Hill, but what he's said so far hasn't been a surprise to anybody. Inflation in America is at its highest in 40 years. It, it's most unusual, by the way. We are sitting with inflation in South Africa at 6.5%. Inflation in America is 8.5%. So if anything, the RAND should be strengthening against the US dollar. The fact that it isn't is a, a function of the relative confidence between the two countries and lots of other funny things that are going on in the world, not least the Ukraine war. But that is the next stage uh, in the whole interest rate drama mm. and the Americans love this drama but remember Mike that interest rates in America have been at almost zero percent since 2009 right up to 2016 they started edging up after 2016 then came COVID they went back to just about zero and there it's it's you know, 0 0.2 or 0.3 percent and now they're starting to gain again so we hear these this talk that American interest rates were up three quarters of a percent, their, their uh, version of our repo rate, yeah. which was the highest probably, well, certainly in many, many years. But it's still below where uh, interest rates were ahead of COVID. So that kind of puts it in perspective. Well, From your side, Zondo, come on, man, you've been, you missed the Zondo here at the Business News uh, office. You, you've been reading through these reports in the little bit of spare time that you have. Yeah. And then last night, they go and dump a couple more terms on your desk. A couple more thousand pages. Yeah, so, you know, let's just step back from this particular one and just look at it in totality. It's, it's five and a half thousand pages across the six parts. And uh, eight extensions were asked for and granted by the State Capture Inquiry. Remember, Alec, when Tuli Marancela envisaged uh, and wrote her State of Capture report, as the public protector, the former PP, she set down that it would take 180 days, 180, six months. That's what was the state capture inquiry was supposed to be wrapped up within six months. It ended up taking over four years. And that's where the eight extensions come in. Because what Jacob Zuma did when he was president is he widened the scope, the terms of reference of the state capture inquiry and said to them, do not only look at me, as Jacob Zuma, the Guptas, at BIP, look at the municipalities. You want to look at corruption? Look at all the corruption. And why? To swamp it, to overload it administratively, to overload the investigators, to maybe turn the, the public narrative against it. You're spending too much time. It's over budget. It's too much money spent. And you completely swamp the South African public with knowledge of corruption. Maybe we get bored by it. Indeed. And, and move on to something more interesting. Yes. So eight extensions, over 330 witnesses who ended up testifying, and it would cost the taxpayer a billion rand, give or take. Good investment? I think time will tell. There are already small shoots of some or other accountability coming through 
from the National Prosecuting Authority and from the Investigating Directorate. A couple of names I want to talk about who's interesting mm. on the new... So every time that a, a new part or volume comes out, there are names that have been put forward for referral for prosecution. So this is not you are being prosecuted. This is, hey, law enforcement, MPA, these are the people we think you should look at. So earmarking personalities yes. and, and which new ones have come out? I'm I'm sure you haven't read the report yet. No, no. But have you managed to pick any new names up yet? So anybody who tells you they've read the report and speaks on it intelligently is a liar <laughs> and most probably a politician. So um, new on the prosecutions list is the former Prosa chief executive, Lucky Montana. Um, he was involved in the 3.5 billion rand Swifombo deal with the trains that were too tall. Do you remember those? Uh, Prasa went to court eventually, try to have that uh, deal set aside because the trains, it would cost us a billion rand to retrofit the trains that were too tall for our networks. Okay. So Lucky Montana is a new name on there. Duduzane Zuma, the uh, son, the Dubai bound son the wannabe next president indeed um of of jacob zuma now this is where he comes into play and i thought it was only for a particular instance when we were talking off camera uh, about being in the room when abc jonas was offered the job of finance minister 600 million rand that he turned down uh, it was in relation to that being in the room when uh, rajesh gupta aka tony gupta offered Mr. Jonas the job. Um, it's in relation to trying to corrupt a public official there. It's also in relation to a second person who says Duduzane Zuma and Tony Gupta were in the room when he was offered a bribe. Now, this man is called Mkolisi Dukwana. He is the former MEC for Economic Development in the Free State. And as the Economic De Development MEC, he held the reins to a project. It was called the City for Tomorrow, CFT in the Free State. It was worth about 140 million rand. The Guptas wanted 80 million rand of that for doing nothing. And they said to Mr. Dukwana, you're going to get 2 million rand a month if you shut your mouth and you sign these papers. To his credit, he said, no, sorry, not going to do it. And he was at the, at the Gupta Saxon World House. He left there at and the Saxon at World, Saxon World Shabin, and he lost his job not long after that. Uh, Ace Magashule was the person who brought him to see the Guptas. Well, this is interesting. Yes. This is interesting. So the Magashule link is now becoming apparent. Magashule's mm. name is also on the list, the new list. Now he's already being prosecuted in relation to the 255 million rand asbestos project. Um, here. The latest, one of the deals, one of the parts of the report deals with the Frieda Dairy Farm, the Astina Dairy Project. And that's where his name and Mosa Benzeswane, the former, former mineral resources minister who flew off, flew off to Switzerland to see Glencore. Um, he is, uh, they are saying that charges should be preferred against Machushule and Mr. Zwane for the Astina Dairy Farm, calling it a Gupta project. And they want the state to sue those two gentlemen for 280 million rand to recover all the money that the state lost because the state would pay over 280 to the Guptas, it would be laundered and it would come back into South Africa and it would fund the Gupta wedding um, I'm just at wondering Sun City. here about Glencore because mm -hmm. we had a piece uh, last week about Glencore admitting yes, corruption. To worldwide corruption. And naming a number of African countries, not South Africa. Strangely enough. Yeah. Paying $1.2 billion. So now here you have a probably corrupt guy in Zwani. Uh, I don't want to say allegedly because that's a cop out. Almost certainly a corrupt fellow. Going off to go and see a corrupt company. Because uh, Glencore, sorry guys. You're now a corrupt company in our view. It's not us saying it. Yeah. You've admitted you to it. it. You said you're corrupt. You said yeah. you, you, you bribe people in Africa. Yes. So what kind of a deal were they doing behind the scene there? It, it could only have been uh, a place where, as a fly on the wall, man, my ears would have been buzzing. So this is also where Duduzane Zuma comes into it. Glencore would sell Optimum Coal Mine, and they would sell it to Tegeta, right? Who was a 64% stakeholder in 
in Tegeta through Mabongela Investments, do design Azuma. How would the Guptas purchase Optimum Coal Mine? With a 600 million rand prepayment from ESCON. So here you are as the son of the sitting head of state. You're a 64% shareholder, the majority shareholder, in the company that purchases a mine that does business with the state, with ESCON. And you get a 600 million rand prepayment and the rest of the money they want him charged for and the state says was laundered money. So that's on those counts, that's where Dudizane Zuma fits in. What a nice place to be when you've got your dad who's running the place and his friends are engineering both the Eskom board and clearly within the Department of Minerals. Uh, it, they really were engaging in industrial scale plunder. Yes. But the good news is, of course, we now know all about this. It's all been confirmed. What's the latest on the Guptas in, in the UAE? They remain behind bars. So they're in jail. They are in jail. Uh-huh. Now, I don't know what an Emirati jail looks like. Not I nice, assume. I believe. I believe not nice at all. Have you been? I've been to Dubai. <laughs> I haven't been to, to their jails. Um, but but they, they remain behind bars. I didn't mean it that way, Michael. I was right. <laughs> the South African government has got 60 days within which to lodge their ap- application. That's all the charges that they need to lay on the table to get these guys extradited. So next on the list there, unsurprisingly, is Arthur Fraser, the former uh, Director General of the State Security Agency. Now, we'll get into why he... <laughs> He is an interesting fellow in relation to our second story with Pala Pala. But there, he is alleged uh, and should be investigated, according to Zonda, for running a parallel uh, spy agency in which money and resources was used for the benefit of the sitting head of state. Then, Jacob Zuma, it was called the Principal Agency Network, and they took money and guns, and they would sign for it and book it out, and the money, there was no accountability for how that money was being spent. And it was basically weaponizing the organs of state to suit and for the benefit of individuals, uh, principally the Guptas and uh, Jacob Zuma and his family. And that's also where a second gentleman comes in, Tulani Glomo. After the July riots, everybody was saying, where are these instigators of the violence? Tulani Glomo was somebody who flew into South Africa. He was an ambassador I think it was Hong Kong, I I speak under correction, but he was very close to Jacob Zuma and his roots are in the state security agency. He is being uh, listed as as those who should be prosecuted for his time in the state security agency. Links back to July riots, is very close to Jacob Zuma, this all links together. David Machlobo, do you remember that Al Jazeera exposed him? So he was the minister of uh, state security. He's the large fellow. Yes, he is. And... Al Jazeera did a documentary where he was speaking on camera to a rhino horn smuggler. And he is uh, being, charges should be preferred against him for his time as the Minister of State Security because he worked with Arthur Fraser and he is believed to have also signed off for millions to be spirited out of the State Security Agency for who knows what. Uh, He is currently the Deputy Minister of Human Settlements, uh, Water and Sanitation in Cyril Ramaphosa's cabinet. This guy sits in cabinet min- meetings. Yes. He is paid for by the taxpayer, has all the perks, Blue Light Brigade almost certainly, yeah. and he was filmed having a conversation yes. with a rhino horn smuggler. I was in a, at, a, at a farm, and we'll talk about that a little later as well, in the Eastern Cape, where every rhino on the farm had to be dehorned to make sure that they were poached because the poaching is out of control in South Africa as we know. But here we've got a, uh, well, a policeman, the person we make the policeman who's actually policing himself being a crook. I was sitting with the head of the Hawks several years back. It was under Chatham House rules. But we were speaking about uh, illicit trade, rhino horn trade, and I asked the question, I said, you guys as the Hawks, what are you doing about David Machlobo, who was caught on camera um, at, a bro- at a brothel, uh, trying to, to, being involved at least, 
calling this guy his friend with a known rhino horn smuggler. They said, no, the, the man who was on camera, an Asian fellow, he's disappeared. And she ended her answer there. I said, but hold on, there's two people in that conversation. Have you not even spoken to my chlobo? And there was an eerie silence in the room like I had done something wrong. By asking the most obvious question, how have you not questioned the guy who's sitting on the other side of the, the camera? I got a WhatsApp from Rob Hersoff this morning. If you recall that at the Biz News uh, conference, the, the one uh, number two, uh, he had a very outspoken speech where he said that effectively, uh, as Helen Ziller has called it, the ANC a criminal syndicate, and his WhatsApp was, you see, you see? <laughs> yes. <laughs> After the report was released. So uh, the implications, Alec, of this report. South Africans are not going to go and read 5,500 pages. But, yeah, but we got you to read it for us. <laughs> yes. So what does this all mean for us? Well, firstly, it's going to end in recommendations. The very last part of this report is the recommendations from Zondo to the president. Essentially, I remember interviewing David Lewis from Corruption Watch before he stepped down many years ago, and he explained it as the president owns the commission. He establishes it. It is his. That report is his property. He can take it and throw it in the dustbin if he so wishes. But he's going to take it, and he's going to, within four months, well, let me not speak out of turn here, Here's the president. He was speaking last night at the union buildings. These are his intentions now that he has the report. In line with the directive of the High Court, within four months from this date, I will formally present to Parliament the full report of the Commission together with an indication of my intentions on the implementation of the Commission's recommendations. And I know that in this regard, we will also be working together with members of Parliament to whom this report is going to be submitted. And collectively, we will deal with state capture and outline precisely what needs to be done. So the president uh, has got until October to present his recommendations and how he's going to implement the recommendations from Zondo. He can disregard some, he can include what he wants. And he takes that to Parliament, and Parliament must then enact those recommendations. Who sits as the majority party in Parliament, Alec? Well, who knows? Of course, it's the ANC, the implicated uh, grouping. Yes. And, and that, I suppose, brings us to Zondo's movement into the whole electoral reform process. Uh, that he, he had comments to make on that. I, you explained it to me, and I think it's worth giving it a wider audience. So... Some people have said, some commentators have already come out to say that Zondo has strayed beyond his mandate here. He was to look at state capture. But what he did was he looked at state capture, he looked at the ANC, he looked at cater deployment, he looked at the state of our municipalities, he looked at the procurement systems in the state, he looked at um, how Parliament holds office bearers accountable if they do so or they don't. He is going to make recommendations to that effect. And he has come out rather controversially to say that there must be massive electoral reform in South Africa in that you and I and anybody out there can vote for an individual to become president, that we are no longer voting for a political party who money exchanges hands, there's a power play, and somebody gets voted into power. He said, then only South Africans have themselves to blame for the person who sits at the top. So we are individually then invested in somebody now that electoral and they can't be recalled presumably because uh, Cyril could be the third ANC president in a row to be recalled by his party. But if yes. we presumably vote for a president, then no political party can recall him if they don't like him anymore. That's correct. And he he even referenced. He said, "This is not to say that bad people won't be voted in to become president." And he said, "You know, across the pond, Trump became the president." He puts this in the report. But if we had the system, he says, we would never have ended up with a person like Jacob Zuma. He makes that bold claim. People have, have said, well, you're straying a bit out of your lane here, Chief Justice, let's not forget. But it's in the context of what went wrong in South Africa. And if you have a political party that is pliable, that is controlled, that there's a lot of money exchanging hands, there's a power play, 
you can end up with, in our current electoral system, you can end up with more, one man being hoisted to president, even though the rest, the rest of the country is going, he's not the man we want there. Yeah, maybe he's the man who's uh, got the largesse to spread among those who he can influence within his political party. But what's happened to electoral reform? We had the court case. Yes. It's supposed to have, uh, we certainly by now would have expected to have heard something. It was Musi Maimane who brought that case to have independent candidates being allowed to stand in elections in South Africa. The Constitutional Court made a ruling there and they sent it back to Parliament to make the necessary legislative changes and reforms so that it was ready by 2024. Now, a cursory reading of what has gone on is our, our lawmakers have waited too long because they say, no, we need time to put it out to public comment first. And it, the IEC may not have enough time to make all the necessary changes on their end to be able to bring it in before 2024. So either it'll mean that the IEC has to go to the Constitutional Court to ask for an extension to the time period in which they can hold the 2024 elections or Parliament has to work really quickly to get these necessary electoral reforms in. And, and we can make a guess on which way it's going to go. Uh, yes. Before we finish off, uh, Cyril and Pala Pala. Yes, I will be quick about this one. Um, the president has come out, he's very much a stickler for process and the matter has been referred to the Hawks. So if you haven't been watching, dear viewer, uh, Arthur Fraser referred the president to uh, law enforcement and says that there was uh, anywhere between four and eight million dollars stuffed in his couch. The money gets stolen. It makes its way out of the country eventually into Namibia and gets spent on a whole bunch of things in, uh, in Cape Town. And that there is a cover up that the perpetrators are brought back to South Africa. There's some sort of underground uh, operation there are allegations of kidnapping and torture and then a cover-up and 150,000 rand is paid to those who burgled the president. So the president has said the Hawks are investigating now. I'm not going to make any further comments. The story has been confirmed by the presidency saying, yes, there was a burglary at his home. They're not confirming the amounts. The Namibians have said when they reached out to the South African authorities, when they caught the man who is thought to be the mastermind, and they said, can we have a case number? Is this man wanted in South Africa? South Africans were mute. So they dropped the charges in Namibia. Now the question is, why was the case not opened? It's, it's one of those peeling of the onion. Certainly the information I have is that this is very embarrassing to the ANC. Forget the president. Yeah. Uh, and that it is, there's a lot more to the story than what we've been told so far. But we don't have confirmation, so let's not stir the... Uh, gossip or the rumor mill. Just to finish off from my side on the Eastern Cape, yes. it it really was great to spend time with Adrian Gardner. There are a few things going on there that are uh, very exciting. He's put together uh, his Mantis Hotel Group, a day game farm. So it's a game farm of 3,000 hectares between uh, Kabecha and Utenhag. Uh, the only the second one in Africa. There's another one for those who've been to Nairobi, you'll remember the, maybe the iconic pictures of, of giraffe next to power lines uh, it, or, or with a, even a backdrop of the Ni Nairobi uh, skyline. It's a similar thing here. It's right on the border of uh, some urban areas, in fact, uh, former townships that are there as well, which is so exciting what they're doing there and, and working with the community to, to uplift it. And the, the 3,000 hectares, have been in a, fa in a family which now lives abroad and they are wanting to, they've always kept it as bush, kept it as a little green lung mm. uh, in that part of the, of the country and they're now wanting to put this to account for the local community. The other thing that uh, I, I saw with Adrian and spent a bit of time was, uh, with him on was the St. Francis Lynx. Uh, there we have, we are partnering with, uh, with Mantis in a development that they're doing which also reflects a couple of things it was supposed to initially be a hotel st francis links took a little while to get going uh, then they considered making it a retirement home that's not um, the thing that that is going to be too attractive nowadays and then along came COVID, 
and it turned everything upside down. St. Francis Lynx is now virtually sold out after a, a, a slow start. St. Francis itself, the state agents have got no stock. So if you want to go and live at the sea, you might be a little late or you might have to really pay up. And remember, St. Francis is one of those re- coastal resorts where you can work remotely from. Mm. Uh, and then this development is a, they've decided instead of doing a retirement home to, put, to make it into a little village in the middle of the St. Francis Lynx. And I must tell you, Mike, I actually, if Jeanette had not you kind of stopped me, it. I was very tempted. And I'm sure that given the, the lack of stock mm. that exists in that area, uh, and indeed for those who want to work remotely, where you've got your own water from the, uh, from the, the resort, where you've got your own power, mm-hmm. where you've got uh, connectivity, um, fiber bandwidth, I can see that this is going to be very popular. So it was great. To, and well done again. Adrian Gardner, as I said earlier, uh, he turns 80 in March and he's still at it. Uh, this is an entrepreneur who loves and believes in, in South Africa and just a, a great guy to spend time with and to absorb some of that wisdom. Well, I think we've almost kept our promise to you. Thank you for joining <laughs> us for the last half hour. We'll be back next week Thursday. See you then. Cheerio.